Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. I've talked about several times in here that I have a huge record collection. Out the front of the studio, there's about uh, 2,000 records up there. And a lot of my bought when I was a teenager, I used to go buy records sometimes just because they looked cool and I'd bring them home and a lot of those were <laughs> ended up being really terrible. But there were a few that ended up having a huge impact on me. And one of them was a band called... TKO. And I just, it was again, one of them. I don't know if I saw them in a magazine or what it was, but I just I'd never heard the record and I just went and saw it one day and I thought I'm going to buy that. And I took it home and I, I don't know what it was, but it just spoke to me. And it was one of those records that just had the perfect amount of energy and angst and whatever a teenage boy needed. And it was, it was kind of one of my go-to records. And uh, amazingly, when I go back to the eighties, that's still is one of my go-tos. I, I love basically every song on that album for some reason just really spoke to me. Well, anyways, I was expanding out this show and I was thinking about wanting to start doing more interviews, bringing people in to talk about big changes in their life. I thought, you know what would be really cool is to go track down uh, some of these people that w really impacted me as a teenager from a music standpoint. And so the first one I looked up was the singer for this band, TKO, and his name's Brad Sinsel, and I tracked him down, and I contacted him, and I said, hey, would you be willing to come on this show? Uh, the, the, he had had an impact on my life musically, and it, it had, had made a change for me, and I know that he had he had all the ups and downs of, of a rock star, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to have him share some of his the changes in his life and so I was lucky enough that he agreed to come on the show and spend a little bit of time with me and we talk about a lot of really really big picture things and how then those impact us on a on a personal level and I really think you're going to enjoy this conversation that we had and so anyway this is my discussion with Brad Sensel. Okay, Brad, thank you again for taking the time to visit with me today. This show is, I call it the Thick and Mystic Moment, and it's a, it's a thing that I came up with a while ago, which is this idea that, that as we have changes in our life, we have, these, we have two different kinds of changes. There are changes that are forced on us, and then there are the changes that we impose on ourselves. And then the, one, of the, one of the secrets in life is navigating those things. <laughs> how do we get through the changes that are forced on us? And how do we stick to the changes that we, that we impose on ourselves? And that's largely what these discussions are about. And so, so I, I, I contacted you, I don't know, it was a little while ago, because you were somebody that uh, when I was a younger guy, I was a... I was a big fan of your band TKO and I thought of all the people that I would love to to talk to on this topic and I know that you've had a, a lot of different changes in your career and I thought you'd be a great person to talk to about this idea of managing and navigating change. And so so anyway, I wanted to to and we've talked a little bit about that you had a few things that we could chat about in here and I just want to turn that over to you to to maybe share uh, share one of these things, and we can get into a little bit more about what that is and and what that means means in your life. Sure, um, I was born in 1954, so yeah, in a sleepy little town, Yakima, Washington, probably thirty thousand people at the time. It's grown since then. Uh, so 54 was post World War II and the Korean conflict, which my dad served in. So it was a very prosperous time uh, for the country as a whole, uh, when you consider that, that in Europe, all the factories had been leveled, uh, nobody was producing anything. All these soldiers came home and found the factories were open and, and retooling, and, and it was a prosperous time. So uh, growing up was, uh, 
an easy 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 life nothing was negative as far as i could see uh in about 1962 however uh the thing that shook me as a child was the cuban missile crisis um being sent home one afternoon a little early uh, with instructions for our parents to time how long it took us to get home in case there was a nuclear attack and wow. then the parents would report to the school so i thought well hell this is this is interesting and, and it is kind of scary um but uh i just i in terms of navigating i just thought well that's the way it is and i'll be fine i i had some encouragement from my dad who took me downstairs uh, because i had other friends that had fallout shelters built in their house i go dad what are we going to do he goes here he took me down to the basement in the fruit cellar yeah, and there's this brick foundation he goes we have 20 minutes though if they're going to hit us they'll hit seattle it'll take 20 minutes to get here and here's i'll pull out these bricks and you and i will dig now later i realized outside that was a 50 50 foot birch weeping birch tree which means we would have been digging into this giant root system he also <laughs> interestingly enough wow. uh pointed to the water heater saying we shut off the intake valve on the water heater and we have 50 gallons of fresh water so i thought okay we're fine so i i was kind of shocked out of this comfort zone i just assumed that everybody was doing fine and i was middle class and figured the rest of the world was everybody's dad had a job and things were hunky-dory but uh the next year in November Kennedy gets assassinated and I that was a pivotal point for me in terms of things aren't all safe and fuzzy and warm I'm there's harm out there and I got sent home again early uh to find my mother weeping and it it, it was a, a catastrophic event uh in my life and and i remember watching live tv as lee harvey oswald was was assassinated and here i am what eight years old uh that was big stuff um but it prepared me for other catastrophic things in life like 9 11. um I didn't fold as as an individual due to bad news coming my way. I learned that there's bad people out there, and my goal is to avoid them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, February of '64 uh, that was a pivotal moment of change musically because the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan. And uh, within a month after that, it's like every every neighborhood had a band in a garage or a basement, and I was no exception. I mean, I, I was still in elementary school, and we were we had to do whatever it was the Beatles were doing, because look at what that does. I mean, the sound, the sight, the just everything was different. And they put a lot of a lot of surfers out of business at the time. <laughs> My sisters, you know, <laughs> Bobby Rydell, and you know, all those forty fives they had kind of got chucked out and and replaced. Um, I think uh, the other tragedy, of course, was. Uh, so JFK was 63. The next year it was Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I remember thinking, what the hell is this? Is the world falling apart? People have gone mad. And the next year, um, the next June, um, Robert F. Kennedy is assassinated. And by that time, 
I just got the mindset of, well, this is how the world is. Uh, there's bad people out there, but I'm not going to let it affect me. And and reflecting uh, bad news has, has served me well, because it, when you're in the music business, there's a lot of bad news that comes your way. You know, when you're not on stage, it, it, it's the label that well, they don't like we don't like this line in the song and i don't hear a hit and and uh i just relate it to the severe tragedies uh that i'd seen and it's not cancer <laughs> you know when you look <laughs> look at bad news um and as long as it's not cancer then i'm good to go i i was struck by 9-11 um, but it goes back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, where here we are again, humanity has lost its mind, but I'm moving on and I will get through it. My family will get through it. And that's pretty much how I view adversity. So th those were the three things that wow. came to mind when you asked the things that, that changed me. Uh, it, I lived a Peter Pan life, and uh, and events like that tend to slap you in the face and pull you out of that. And I, I'm still struggling with the Peter Pan uh, <laughs> aspect of my life. Um, but being said, I'll be turning 70 at the end of the month. Um, I have slowed down on the Peter Pan aura that that I've been living for sure. <laughs> you brought up so many really, I mean, these things you're talking about there are pivotal on an individual level and obviously on a national and international level. I mean, the, the whole Beatles thing in February of 64 right that that that's interesting because you were as you said you were in elementary school when that happened right so so i i have to know what did you did you immediately go start singing or did you learn how to play the guitar or what was it that you started doing then after seeing the beatles yeah yeah uh the first thing i did out uh, it their instruments were um like paul mccartney's bass I'd never seen a bass like that. I, the only bass guitars typically in America were Fender Precisions, P basses. And right. here's this goofy looking thing that I was drawn to. And my sister- Looked like a violin almost. Well, funny you should the, say that. My that sister funny shape. Uh, had taken violin in middle school and uh, I swiped her violin, took it out to my clubhouse and uh, took the little chin thing off so it would look more like McCartney's bass. Of course, my dad was not happy. <laughs> but eventually, uh, awesome. that led to my mom took me to Value Mart uh, for my birthday, and I got a uh, Ventura 12 string. So I'm in sixth grade at this point. Um, so it, it took me, what, uh, three, four years before seeing that and actually contemplating being part of that world. So here I am with the 12 string, don't know how to play. I put a band together. Uh, the drummer has a snare drum and a cymbal and we have no bass player. So I guess it was just a two piece and <laughs> didn't know chords. Eventually we got another guitar player. We still didn't have a bass player. Um, nobody knew chords. So we would just play the root note, which worked really well for sure. Louie Louie. And, and this, is, this is an acoustic guitar. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I graduated to electric in eighth grade and I think it was a Tysco. It it was brutal. I picked one up. My friend Brent Arns, who's a artist and producer, 
went out and bought one because we missed them. Lyle, that was the brand, Lyle. Uh, and I played that thing, never changed the strings. They started unraveling and cutting my fingers. <laughs> uh, that was great. But by the, we would play the junior high dances and we'd know, we knew like three songs, House of the Rising Sun, finally put some chords together there, Gloria, uh, Louie Louie and The Witch by The Sonics. That that was some badassery right there. Wow. But we'd play three songs and then play them again. And nobody seemed to mind. Right. It's a much simpler time, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Especially when I look, look at a box full of expired contracts. Definitely a simpler time. That's awesome. This is, you just hit on a couple more of these things. I mean, these are these moments that I talk about that when, when you start talking about these things, you have that moment when you get this guitar. That, that You said it was a 12 string, the first one you yeah. got? Yeah. That's brutal to have your first guitar be a 12 string. That's it, tough well, on the tuning. fingers. And tuning. Don't it. know how to tune. There's no YouTube, <laughs> you know, to yeah. find a tutorial. But uh, I, I think my brother-in-law uh, came to the rescue at some point and showed me some basic first position chords. And that got me through Gloria and uh, Dirty Water, uh, some of those mid-60s hits. Yeah. Um, and my brother-in-law bequeathed me, and I'd kill myself that I got rid of it, a Fender Duo Sonic um, electric. It was blue metal flake with a gold metal flake pick guard. And with it came a Fender wow. Tremolux piggyback combo uh, with the tan covering on it and the purple yeah. grill cloth. And I kicked myself because uh by 69 i was into you know i i went from the beatles to the animals beatles animals stones and then cream hit and once again everything changes and i start i'm in the ninth grade i'm middle class kid what do i have to sing the blues about but i start becoming infatuated with the blues so Muddy Waters, uh, Howlin' Wolf, all that stuff came to me after falling in love with Cream. I, I started delving into well, where did this come from? And so here I am in 1969 uh, singing the blues in, in a very heavy way. Uh, and I attracted God, these, some of them were in college, and I'm not in high school yet, and I'm the lead singer. <laughs> well, this is yeah, this is a wanted to ask because you're you're there's Jack Bruce, you know, and and listening to him sing because he's definitely not a he has a really pure voice, wonderful voice. I mean, it's it, it was beautiful, and then, uh, but you you have a really obviously raw raw energy. To how you sing, and so what? The, you know, interestingly, that we bring this up. What was that moment when you said, "Hey, wait a minute, I'm a singer." What What made you realize that? How did that How did that happen? Was there a, Was there a moment when that When that hit you? What was it that What happened? Well, it always came so naturally to me. Um, Any time a band was put together, I was a singer. Uh, so hmm. growing up from elementary school into junior high and finally into high school, um, I kind of became the go-to singer guy. So I was at this one level of being comfortable, uh, as a singer. I didn't think, you know, anything special, like I'm the lead singer. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was more, um. A matter of fact this is what i do um high school came and went uh and i followed my girlfriend 
to Seattle and um, got, I think I answered an ad and ended up in a Bowie tribute kind of hmm. Bowie Alice Cooper. I was very much, I had switched from standard stuff uh, and kind of went into more arty forms like Alice Cooper, David Bowie. Mm -hmm. uh, I think T-Rex was kicking in around then. And uh, and by that time, it was like, yeah, this is what I do. And I never had a second thought of, you know, being a drummer or a guitar player. Although there have been times where I've been on major tours and decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play rhythm on that so you guys can handle the double leads. And you can see... I've always had extremely competent guitarists and they were kind enough not to roll their eyes in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I, I think it was during uh, TKO's first tour with the Kinks. We were getting, the, the Kinks are legendary. Mm -hmm. And what's also legendary, I found this out from having lunch with Ian Hunter. Uh, Whoa. And I had just finished the first tour where we were literally booed off the stage nightly. Um, and it was the Upper East Coast, uh, Upper Crust Colleges. And so you had these spectacle bearded um, elitists sure. with their arms crossed in the front row, shaking their head while you're performing. And... <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to, I had to develop a thick skin. So I I went from just being a singer to more of a ringmaster, if you will, and taking command of that stage. Um, and, and I kind of fell back to my days of playing tennis, where my father kind of had the attitude of never let him see a sweat. Um, because a, an audience can pick up if you are not confident. Mm -hmm. And a, an adverse audience, they will throw things and beat you. <laughs> you know. So I had to harden on that tour. But at lunch with Ian Hunter, I'm crying in my beer. And he goes, well, don't you know uh, that all managers at the time... Uh, would send their new acts out to open for the kinks just for this purpose hmm. to harden them to what to expect and how to get around that and i talked to promoter john bauer he goes oh hell yeah and th that's kind of a standard thing so so i got more aggressive in my delivery as a front man and it started working <laughs> so i said well it ain't broke don't fix it so i became this angry ringmaster for a while and that and and about that time i always had a growl in my voice mm -hmm. but i think by the time in your face came around that might have developed into more and that's kind of a combination of you throw everything in the blender and, and you know there's some daltry in there there's some robert plant in there of course these guys would say what the hell's he talking about but but it's my interpretation of what they did because they were both big influences with a little jagger thrown in there i you've mentioned a couple times your dad uh, it, it, taking you into the basement, you know, and, and talking about nuclear war and now talking about tennis and giving you counsel. Wh what, where was he with the rest of your musical interest? He, uh, he never said anything negative. He came to a couple of performances, uh, that, that were pretty, pretty huge, um, First big show was opening up for the New York Dolls, and he came to that. And 
looking back, I don't think he was too impressed. Um, <laughs> Uh, because I, I wanted to impress him, and we're the opening act, and I'm like, well, now that I'm a rock star, I need a hotel room. So I paid $5. This is at the Moore Theater in Seattle. They had a an old hotel uh, that was called the, uh, the Moore Hotel, but it had been turned into uh, a home for old sailors and Social Security guys where you could rent a room for $5 a night. They've since revamped the more and it's gorgeous. Um, but back then it, it was a $5 room. So after the show, uh, I take them up to my hotel suite. My, I, my dad's, in hindsight, he was very kind. <laughs> he didn't say, what the hell are you doing? Uh, he just was not impressed. Um, <laughs> his. It, we like to drink beer together, and uh, we'd have our beers, and and uh, usually if I was home, it was because something went wrong with the record company, and I was taking time off. So after a few beers, I'd start whining about it. And he would always say, uh, well, I'm sure Johnny Cash doesn't have those problems, or Willie, or, you know, he named all these country guys. And I try to make it to his cemetery uh, plot uh, on his birthday and have a little conversation with him. And this year, I'm going, I, I, after he died, Donnie Einer, my ex-president of Columbia Records, um, fired Johnny Cash. So I want to have a conversation with my dad <laughs> about about that he came from the depression so if you have a job um you have a job you get up and go to work at you know eight to five kind of thing and this didn't appear as any kind of stability and i think he won't what he wasn't impressed with was the ups and downs because the highs are high but the lows are lows and it's a continual pull on that kind of thing. So you actually witnessed on TV Jack Ruby. I did. Shooting. I did. We often talk about how when Kennedy got shot, that was, uh, I mean, that changed the whole, the whole country. The and whole country, the we, if you look at it, uh, was that 63? It, it starts going this way and and within a few years uh, you have civil unrest and and that utopia that i was raised in was slowly eroding around me because uh kenny administration what did they call it um Camelot. Camelot. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it it truly was. It was very storybook. You know, there was a, as history, you know, more and more information comes in. Yeah, some shady crap went on, but compared to what we have going on in modern day, uh, it was it's pretty utopic in my book. You had TKO for uh, you had what was it? Three albums. Actually, four. That- they, they released what was supposed to be the second one um, uh, two years ago, I think. So all okay, in all, there's, there's four of those. When was the pivotal moment that you realized you like being in front of people performing? I, or, or do you? I mean, I'm assuming you do because you're talking about being the ringmaster and it is all about if you get in front of a crowd and you can take charge, that makes all the difference in the world. Well, if it so, was the YWCA dance that I I got to get up and sing, that was big news, you know. It just you start going up the ladder, and each step up is like, oh, I like this too. Um, the YWCA dance. Yeah, I probably was in the seventh great you know but i had arrived you know there's there's 22 kids there you know 
Then I look at the Texas Jam in 79, and I'm in front of 80,000 people. And we had been, we had been out doing 20,000 20, seaters where that was becoming the norm. Um, the week before we did the Mississippi River Festival, and that was 40,000. But that, that was, you know, it wasn't a stretch. It kind of looked the same as the 20,000, just a little bigger, and it was outdoors. Then comes the Texas Jam, and holy crap, walking up the ramp, um, it's kind of like, is this the gallows? Or, <laughs> I mean, you get up to stage level and it's literally a sea of humanity. And you realize it's too late to change your mind as to whether you want to be a lead singer. It's go time. That that was a... But once you get started, you just start with the front row and work your way back to the last cheap seat. Um, and that that holds true on the big shows or the small shows. What so, so the that one was obviously a pretty big pivotal moment there too. That's a huge crowd. Yeah, and it carries its own energy. Yeah, when you're doing something like that. So and this was I, I'm, I'm, now I'm curious. This was you said this was '79. Yeah. So this was after the TK, TKO's what first album then is in support of the first album. Okay. Because the second one, In Your Face, came out, what, 83, 84? I can't remember exactly Eight, when it was. I, I think it came out in 85. It was recorded okay. in 81. But oh, no kidding. Yeah, but but uh, it was under a production deal, which production deals are where the, the entity has all the say in what happens with the band and the label doesn't get much. So it was a hard sell to the majors. Um, Production deals were very popular in the 70s, but labels started realizing they would lose a lot of power um, under these agreements. So so they were passing, and it wasn't until 85 where we struck a deal with Barry Coburn and Relativity uh, to put that out. And, and a lot of the excuses in 81 were, eh, it's, it's too heavy. And 81. probably 84, you have Metallica and, mm -hmm. you know, all, all these grinder bands, you know, what, that isn't too heavy? Yeah. <laughs> made me sound like Pat Boone. <laughs> and so, so by 86, that stuff was ruling the roost and it was too melodic. So well, it's it's too heavy. It's now it's too light, you know. The audience is a fickle, fickle thing. Yeah. So if you'd be one, I'd really love to hear the the experience of finding out uh, get, whether it's getting a record contract or landing the big show, where it's like, hey, we get to go do this thing. The 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 personal experience of, of hearing that information. Do you follow what I'm asking? Yeah. This moment of, whoa. Yeah, the, the thing I learned, uh, the joy of the first record deal. Uh, I learned later, it's not just getting the deal. Once you've got the deal, then you have to hang on to the deal. And that's where it gets tricky. It, pretty much how they used to handle it is they would coddle you for a year uh, while they're you're recording it and putting it out. Uh, once it once it comes out, uh, they give it a, a clock of six weeks to decide how much investment they're going to continue with. So it's not just about the deal; it's about getting that deal and hanging on to it. Uh, as far as shows go, you know, we went from the disastrous experience of the Kinks uh, to Cheap Trick. We opened for Cheap Trick. Uh, it was their first 
uh, headlining tour since Budokan. Hmm. So that audience immediately took to us. And so you went from disaster to this is a great tour. Um, but in, in terms of one-off gigs, um, they become a blur after a while. And so the big hassle is there's usually 400 miles between each show. Uh, and that becomes, that becomes the marker of, of staying in shape of the road, uh, living with little or no sleep, uh, fast food, uh, and, and it used to be too much party party, but <laughs> when you're young, you somehow can do that. Yeah. One of the things that having known a lot of musicians myself in life, 99.9% .9 of them never get out of their basement. And, and I've attributed that often to, to something like commitment, uh, sticking to something even when you don't feel like doing it anymore. And I, I wonder how that, how that element played into your life. Again, it goes from probably my father instilled in me, um, goes back to the tennis court, you know, you just don't quit. Um, and I was a terrible tennis player, but I refused to quit. Um, kind of grew up uh, with un undiagnosed ADHD. So a lot of a lot of things my brain wouldn't take in. Um, but the one thing was uh, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Uh, and in terms of, of singing, um, you you get bad reviews, you get good reviews. My gosh, you can, I can show you a hundred glowing reviews, but out of that, there'll be three bad ones, and those are the ones that I focus on for some reason, which is which <laughs> is odd, because. Uh, they estimate that now 25,000 songs a day are coming out on streaming level. Wow. Now with the yeah. the uh, record labels, that that whole industry is gone. It's just, it, and although I used to loathe it, there was a method to their madness and not everybody got a shot. It, you were there on your merit. Um, now it's just you're competing with so many voices. I mean, recording studios used to uh, were replaced by Pro Tools home studio, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And now I, I remember producer Tom Panunzio, uh, I was laying down a track for War Babies and I was having difficult with the ending. He goes, well, let's just punch it in. I go, no, I, I, I want to do it as part of the whole. He goes, well, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And uh, the next week, we're shopping, uh, I don't know, on Melrose or something. And uh, Smells Like Team Spirit comes on the sound system in the store. And I went in the studio the next day, and I said, I got a feeling <laughs> everybody's going to start doing it because that's when the slide went from big big show, cock rock, big hair, big band, big flash pots, to strip down. It was back to the three chords um, and flush the fashion and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, now I've lost myself. Where were we? <laughs> You start talking about that. I've actually talked about that moment in this show a dozen times. The the day, the night I heard Smells Like Teen Spirit the first time, it was like everything changed. Yeah. I was like, wow, all the music I listen to, I don't think I like it anymore. 
you know, it just because that was just so amazing. It was so powerful and so different. And, and that came from your, your world. Right. Uh, you know, another musical point I remember where everything changed <clears throat> was the Mississippi River Festival. And on the bill was Heart and Nazareth. And underneath, um, the promoter told John Bauer, yeah, I thought it'd be a good idea. I, I found a bunch of alphabet bands. And it's UFO, ACDC, <laughs> okay. and TKO. And <clears throat> I don't care. I'll take it. It's 40,000 people. You can laugh all you want. Um, but I remember... Um, uh, you're given wristbands uh, for which catering tent you can go into. And the alphabet bands were given a lesser lesser okay. band. And Bon Scott and I were asked to leave the tent because we had the incorrect uh, wristband. And I, I can't recall what he said. It was a mumble, but I remember looking around, I, I'd listened to ACDC at that time because it's 79 and Highway mm -hmm. to Hell is just hitting number one. But when I first saw the band, I thought, well, whose roadies are those? <laughs> because you had Hart dressed in all their finery and Nazareth with uh, their bass player with the golf hat and the flared pants and the... Mm -hmm the slightly lifted heel uh but acdc comes on and i said to myself everything is changing today they mopped up that show mm -hmm. um that the crowd never recovered um it was the damnedest thing because i'd been out with heart heart before and by the time they hit the stage, the crowd was worn out from boogie into ACDC. And within a year, they were the headliner. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a everything changed moment for me. Yeah, I believe it. Wow, that's, yeah. Yeah, it, that stripped down rock and roll, these little five foot four guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was, yeah, I believe it. And, and Highway yeah. to Hell, the, one of the greatest rock anthems ever. It's cyclical um, musically because there used to be a seven-year theory that there'd be these changes. But I think what happens is, and it's been obviously talked about again and again, is musicians get in the studio with their record deal and all of a sudden they've gone from their four four track recording abilities to oh look we have 24 tracks mm -hmm. and all these gizmos and and they do what musicians do they create but in doing that they get things more complex and more complex and pretty soon there has to be a live show and it's got to be more complex and glittery and and everything gets shined up and homogenized and then all of a sudden somebody comes back with a three chord song and it it's it's healthy it's a culling of the herd <laughs> if you yeah it, I, I think it's yeah. been a healthy thing one of the things that we were messaging about a little bit that's a big change for you now is this whole approaching 70. oh yeah man and and this is a again these are all these mile markers and changes that happen what talk talk to that for a second i think it was three years ago i did a uh tko show at a german festival and i I'd, I'd done a seattle show I'd, I'd do splattering reunion shows just lightly here and there um but that was me at 65 uh, and 66, respectively. Um, so I, I said by 65, I was like the, singing songs that were written from a 20, 
three-year-old perspective, uh, I noticed that there wasn't the drive because I'm looking back at that 23-year-old and I remember what I was bitching about and I got to put a little extra to get that out where it used to come naturally. I'm not real angsty anymore. I, I look for comfort. I still love to sing and I still record, but uh, am I angry with the world? Sure. Um, I, but I'm just looking for comfort these days. And I, I'm kind of a gentleman rocker. Like I'll put, I'll put a single out on an annual basis. Um, I did one with Mike McCready and some friends uh, under the moniker of Angels of Dresden and across all streaming platforms, um, we were close to a million streams. Wow. And to date, I've received $37.42. <laughs> so so I, I look at my ASCAP yeah. royalty uh, statement and you can see the streams are counted out individually, and it's 0 0.0007. So if you take a penny and you start filing, how, how much is left of a penny? I mean, it's, it makes Tin Pan Alley look attractive in, in my book. So um, I play, probably once annually just because it's in my dna because i have to i just that that connection with the audience will never go away um but i for the last 18 years to make a living uh I've become a media director for a giant uh law firm oh wow and that's where I get my money, so I don't have to take every offer anymore. A, a lot of a lot of eighties, nineties guys and that I know uh, have stepped away. I mean, there's no structure within the recording industry anymore. Right. There's no Daddy Warbucks uh, and blood out of a turnip. Um, so. I think keeping an artist hungry had a lot to do with the conviction of angst off in your face. <laughs> you can mm -hmm. hear it. I'm pissed off. Where today, I, I'm pissed off, but not that level of pissed off. Interesting. That's partly why, I, you know, as a, as a young teenage boy, that connected with me the way it did, just because there was that, you could feel it. And for that testosterone-driven 14, 15-year-old kid, I was just, you know, it, it had everything that I needed at that point. So I can, I totally relate to that. Last thing, War Babies. You've, I've, I know you put out some new songs with this. I, a matter of fact, the, I, I've listened to him, The Man with the Golden Arm. And, and this brings up another question, because you had, um, you, you would have there's a few people that you would have lost that you have known uh that's about somebody that that uh from one there was a key part of the seattle scene that died and i was actually going to ask you another did you know um uh, the singer for sanctuary nevermore um because he died about yeah, five yeah, six years he ago and i appeared at the grand opening of the experience music project paul allen's big rock museum uh, they had an opening day thing, and he and I and Dave Wayne out of Metal Church okay. uh, were supposed to sing together that day. And I I bailed because I didn't want to be a backup singer. And now mm -hmm. I'm kicking myself because both Dave and and uh, the Nevermore guy, they both passed away, and I missed an opportunity to do that. But we appeared together, and we partied together. He's kind of like the next generation up from me. So I, I've got 10 to 12 years on everybody. You're putting out, and the War Baby stuff that you're putting out right now is, this is stuff that you recorded uh, um, back in the, 
back Nin- in the 90s then? Yeah, ni- I think it was April of 1990. Recorded at London Bridge Studios, which of course, Alice in Chains, uh, Pearl Jam did stuff there. I, I think uh, Soundgarden did some work there and, and we did. It was at a time where uh, Jeff Ament, the bass player who's down in Pearl Jam, was in between his band Mother Love Bone and Pearl Jam because singer Andrew Wood had, had died of an overdose. So we were all managed by the same management company and Kelly came to me and said, uh, I know you're looking for a new bass player. Why don't you take Jeff on? Because he needs a job. So um, hmm. we hired Jeff. So so we recorded 12 songs, and they kind of looked at the songs that are now coming out are based on that recording session. Uh, and they didn't like those songs. And it... It was basically Columbia uh, sticking their nose where it didn't belong. They were on the wrong side of the glass. These songs are great songs. Uh, they they were pushing us uh, to be more Aerosmithy because mm. it wasn't for sure Aerosmith was going to come back. So if they didn't get Aerosmith back, they'd have a Aerosmith. So they left mm-hmm. all these songs that I would consider would have fit well within uh, grunge land. Uh, and I can see where they made the decision. It's too grungy. And, and they made us work with people like Paul Stanley to be more mainstream. So it, they're all great songs. And I'm looking forward to that release. Yeah, you you actually, yeah, I, know, I read somewhere that you had actually penned one of these with Paul Stanley. Like, Oh, yeah. His reputation precedes him. He is a bully. Uh, he's rude. He's all the things that were advertised. Uh, I showed up at his house in the hills in Hollywood uh, late due to traffic. Uh, and, and right out of the gates, he says, before we get started, I just have to clear the air and, and tell you something you need to know. I'm like, what is it? He goes. It's your cowboy boots. Nobody's wearing cowboy boots. Those are yesterday. Really? And the boots I was wearing were a gift from Santa, Andrew Wood's betrothed. Uh, After he passed away, she gave me his custom boots to wear. So I would wear them. Later, I decided they were haunted. But uh, this had pissed me off. Uh, him remarking that about my favorite pair of boots. Uh, so we start playing back and forth with our both have acoustics. And he says, oh, we could do something like this. It's, it sounds like something off Love Gun. And and uh, I'm still steaming from the boot comment. <laughs> so I, I said, look, Paul, it's not like I owned a Kiss doll. That kind of set the tone for the rest of <laughs> the half hour. Uh, his ego is so big. Um, and I was looking at it like it was a catastrophe, but we got in the studio. He came in the studio, uh, very much a diva. Uh, I had to tell him his D string was flat and... I could hear sighs, and it's like, well, tune your guitar. I mean, how hard is it? Uh, and But once we got going in the studio, I was amazed at how talented musician the guy is. I mean, he is a great guitarist. He, he did uh, finger picking on a 12 string for Cry hmm. Yourself to Sleep. And I was mesmerized by it. I kind of put the F you bully thing down and just enjoyed it. Uh, and I read in his biography, I was skimming through it, and I, I saw the part about he had a deformed ear yeah. uh, as a kid. And, yeah. and 
it always bothered me that we didn't hit it off. You know, I, I'm a reasonable guy. I like to get along with people. Um, but reading that, I'm like, well, this explains the bully. Um, because that came from, if you're a child being bullied, you either learn to bully back or you perish. And, mm -hmm. and I think it explains a lot of his character. So yeah. I don't hate the guy. I understand yeah. him now. But talented musician. Wrap this up. You're a married man with kids. Yeah. And and that and that is a big change in life too, especially somebody that had the that lived the life that you had. Any grandkids by the way? Not yet. It, it's a whole generation of people that that really aren't chasing that dream. I'm finding, but uh I've seen that in other generations where I'll never do this and I'll never do that and nature takes over. <laughs> so Fingers crossed. <laughs> Indeed. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, it's just my wife and I now. So uh, I've taken to pet rescuing. And wow. we are full up. Dogs, cats? Uh, one one eyed Shih Tzu. Okay. Uh, and three cats. Uh, one was left on the side of the road in a cardboard box. Uh, the other showed up at the back door, uh, meowing as a kitten. So the wife took that in. And the third one, uh, down here where my studios are, uh, there's a canal that runs the property line. And I, I fed this cat for three years. It was so feral. It would wait till I'd leave and then it would run, eat the food and go hide in the arborvitae bush. Okay. Uh, it now resides in my sock drawer. But we've That's decided awesome. no more kids, no more pets. <laughs> so we'll see we'll see what life looks like after pets. <laughs> Brad, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been really enlightening. Uh, it, it's so interesting to listen to these stories and these different things that had these big impacts on your life. And I really, really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me today. Well, it was good visiting with you. I've met a new friend. Indeed. All right, Brad. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. <laughs>